So I have a two-part question for you here. First, how excited were you when you saw a soundtrack by Queen in the opening credits? And second, how disappointed were you when you heard the songs? <laughs> um, okay, so answer to question number one, uh, extremely excited. Probably a six to midnight kind of situation. Like, it was that excited. <laughs> yeah. uh, I love Queen. Correct me if I'm wrong, their soundtrack, like, popped my first Crit 20 on this podcast. Yeah, that's true. Flash Gordon. It was definitely killer in Flash Gordon. I loved it. This one, I I guess my complaint would be how infrequently their songs were used. Like, they didn't drive the story like they did in Flash Gordon. I did not want there to be more of their songs because, again, the offerings they were given were not strong, in my opinion. I was not a fan of that. But I'll tell you what did get me excited in this movie. The Canon Films logo showing up at the beginning. Ah, uh, yeah, I saw One that, One third too. of our holy trinity. Always a welcome sight. Welcome to Bad Movies uh, and Beer. I'm Cooper. And I'm Nolan. And today we are discussing... Highlander. There can be only there one. There can be only one. <laughs> exactly. Uh, one man's quest to survive a battle of immortals and not be one of the immortals who dies. As I say it now, it just sounds ridiculous. Like on paper, it makes no sense. No, it is an absolutely shitty story. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> As a massive nerd and fan of sword and sorcery, I was pretty excited. This is one that you would think would have been right up my alley. I should have seen for sure growing up, but I had never seen before. I was under the massive misconception that the Highlander traveled through time. Yeah, I can see how you would think that. I mean, we kind of do through his eyes in the course of this movie, which we will, of course, get to all that later on. But before we do that, what did you think of last week's episode where our wives took over? <laughs> that was pretty fun, or at least I think it was. You know what wasn't fun? Fucking trying to edit down like the three hours of audio they recorded. <laughs> it was fucking yammering on for like ever. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, I'm glad they had a good time uh, talking about such a tremendous movie. I mean, it seems like they did have a good time. And to be like, the, the part that just confused me though was their complaint was there's no plot to this movie. We have nothing to talk about. And they talked for like fucking three hours. All it takes is just a small grain of rice to start that fucking avalanche going. And it worked here. You see a grain of rice because my wife's Asian? You fucking <laughs> racist. What the hell, man? <laughs> It's not cool. <laughs> I wish there was intention. You're that, supposed that to be the fucking. It, you're it you're allegedly the woke guy. This is the shit you pull on me. I, Jesus I wish there was, uh, yeah, some intention in that. That would have been funny. I did a great job, honestly. I think that they had a lot of fun, and that's uh, I, more than I expected. I thought they were gonna have a terrible time and be mad at us, but it's gonna be a good time. Yeah, yeah. No, that was cool. Uh, we will see how others feel about it. I think there's some decent feedback already. I mean, if nothing else, I'm glad that we did this because why not? It was a fun experience and we got a week off and they got to fucking do their thing. And, you know, that sounded really genuine. It's the best I could muster. <laughs> I, I'm sleep deprived from trying to edit that fucking episode. Uh, no, I think it was really fun. Thank you. Ladies. Definitely. Nolan and Cooper. There you go. But today we should mention this was originally we put this out there for our uh, season premiere well, face off between that and Starship Troopers, and this got his ass handed to it. People did not want to yeah, hear this one then. They nobody wanted, wanted Troopers. Yeah. <laughs> nobody wanted this movie. Um, it got a few votes, but Starship <laughs> Troopers won in a vast, vast majority. So that's funny. Um, but we're doing it now. Yeah, we're taking we're care here. of it now. We're coming back. The Highlander story deserves to be told. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Does it? <laughs> well, as we always do, we pair a beer. Yeah. Speaking of stories that need to be told, though. This beer, we're not even sure if this is still being made or by who. The, the, the beer is shrouded in mystery, much like the Highlander itself. <laughs> I think it's gone through more incarnations than uh, Connor McLeod here in our movie. Right? <laughs> yeah, different um, identities. And yeah, yeah, exactly. So this one's hard to describe. This is not a brewery, but a brewing company. So this is one of those places that pays for space in another brewery and makes it. And the brand is the Highlander Brew Co. Yeah, you've explained this to me before. They kind of contract out like their recipe and their name or whatever and get someone else to brew and distribute it for them. Yeah, so they help use spaces. It's It can be really expensive, obviously, to create your own craft brewery. So places that like good recipes or want to brew beer or create a brand can do that out of someone else's space. And that's what this company, Highlander Brew Co., does. Except when we kind of tried to look them up and follow them, it, it appeared like there was a massive paper trail. Yeah, str strangely enough, it sounds like once upon a time they were possibly brewing independently, but then they ended up, there was like a news release from like November of 2020 that now they're going to be brewing out of the South River Brewing Company, who we're going to try a beer from later on this season, 
But then like less than a month later, there was another news thing saying that now they were going to be brewing with New Ontario Brewing, who we drank our showgirls beer from clothing optional back in fucking season two there. And and but then like after that, subsequently, they haven't updated their social media since like 2022, like April of 2022. So we're very unclear of where this beer is currently being manufactured, if it is currently being manufactured. Although the date on the bottom of the can, is that a canning date or a best before date? Canning. It's December 2022. So recent. So yeah, still being made possibly. But again, much like Connor McLeod himself, <laughs> many identities uh, in many different places. This beer is, in a weird way, super fitting for this episode. Incredibly fitting. They had three offerings that I could see on their website. Uh, they had a smoke porter and they had a blackberry wheat. But of course, for the Highlander, and our main character here is Connor McLeod, a very strong Scotsman. We have the Scottish Ale. So I'm excited to try this. It says smooth and mellow session ale. So kind of low on the alcohol, or you'd think it'd be low. It's a 5.4 percenter. Yeah, I've uh, had this before, and it is. It's it, it's a beer that I enjoy drinking. So that should tell you everything you need to know about the ABV and the <laughs> lack of a hoppy nature. Yeah, and the sort of, uh, I, I'm expecting a lot of malt uh, forward notes, very caramely. Definitely. This is a good, I think this is a good cold weather beer. So the fact that we are drinking it as the weather continues to be cold i think it fits nicely yeah love it so uh let's crack into it absolutely there can be only one <laughs> until we drink the next ah. <laughs> i i think the mistake they made in naming their brewery is that they had more than one kind of beer that's you're right that's a glaring oversight yeah if yeah. you're gonna name it the highlander you can only brew one and do it really really well so before the credits begin, we get a prologue telling us that from the dawn of time they came, moving silently down through the centuries, living many secret lives, struggling to reach the time of the gathering, when the few who remain will battle to the last. No one has ever known they were among us until now. This is narrated by the unmistakable voice of Sir Sean Connery, and at this point, I was totally in. Fuck yeah, bring on the gathering. <laughs> yeah, um... All I can say is that while watching this, it, it had me move into, I was excited. I actually kind of miss that we've moved away from a credit and a scroll. Sean Connery, obviously an undeniable voice. You knew immediately who it was. And I was sort of curious. I was like, I saw him on the cover and I'm like, what's his role in this thing? Oh my God. Well, that is a whole separate thing that comes up later. But from there, we fade in on something I definitely was not expecting to see. 1980s wrestling footage. The fabulous Freebirds make their entrance in Madison Square Garden to face off against Jumpin' Jim Brunzel, Greg Gagne, and the Tonga Kid in six-man tag team action, and the crowd is going absolutely insane. All except for an extremely intense-looking man seated in the upper bowl. It's Christopher Lambert playing the role of Connor McLeod, but we know him better as the Highlander. <laughs> uh, I knew, so you asked me when I saw the Queen soundtrack how excited I was. I knew you had a massive erection as soon as we rolled in on that ring. It took me back to my, I'm a big wrestling fan, it took me back to my childhood of like whatever, I, right away, I was very excited. What bothered me about the scene was the fucking lighting on the Highlander's eyes. Like they pull up and he's just sitting there looking so fucking moody and he's got the, like, the light stripe. This is ridiculous. I was like laughing right away when I saw him. Oh, I laughed too because I did not understand who he was or what was happening. Even though we had that scroll, I was not prepared for how quickly this next like transition and scene happens. Oh God, they get right into it. The vicious in-ring combat causes him to flash back to his life on the Scottish Highlands, hence the name and a particularly brutal battle that happened centuries ago. And I have to say, they are infusing a lot of film craft here early on with dramatic cuts, frantic voices and background noise, and even some kind of swooping jib shot that takes us up to where he's sitting in the first place. Yeah, I agree. I think they're trying real hard. Um, I, the cuts are quite jarring, and they're happening pretty quickly, and they are definitely sort of comparing that war to the wrestling that's happening in the ring. The, like, combat is definitely dated. You feel the age of this movie when they get into those sort of Scottish Highlands oh, fighting. Oh, the effects, and, yeah. The, the effects and the speed and the choreography of the fighting has just been done so much better over the past couple decades that this one felt like it was not very good from that. Although you could tell they were imbuing a lot of craft and time and energy into those scenes. Definitely. Now, either this all proves too much for him to handle, or he senses something in the parking lot, because he leaves before the finish of the match and stalks through the silent lot almost as if he's looking for something. Sure enough, what looks like a Secret Service agent pops out from behind a pillar and calls him by name. I thought maybe he was there to ask him to help save the president, but what is he really there to do? 
Uh, yeah, it's weird. His dress was funny. Um, he is there to fucking kill the Highlander. So very quickly, they both pull out swords. Yeah, why the fuck do they both have like katanas? Or I guess the other guy's sword is not a katana, but like he's been walking around with a sword in his fucking trench coat all day long. I guess so. I was really confused about why this happened and where it came from. I don't think they gave me enough at the start. And I guess they've done that intentionally to build some mystery around it. But I struggled when we got into this. I was almost like, who is the good guy? Who's the bad guy? Do I care here? They know each other. So we know that there's some backstory between them, but they don't give us any of that. And then they get into just a ridiculous sword fight. Yeah. Now, thanks to the prologue, we can infer this is one of the few remaining who will battle to the last. But like you said, they don't really do a good job of explaining this. Um, but yes, this guy is here to kill the Highlander, like you said, and apparently the way he's going to do that is by doing about a thousand backflips. Oh my god. He's just fucking backflipping through this parking lot like he's in a goddamn gymnastics competition, (laughs) like, over and over again. (laughs) That was definitely the most memorable part, was the fact that this older man, like, he's older than the Highlander, too, is just doing this series of tumbles, right, over and over and over again, very quickly... These swords are more powerful than regular swords because they are causing sparks and explosions everywhere. Well, and he slices into a fucking concrete pillar at one point. Yeah, he. but they hit a car with it and the cars start exploding. You know how I feel about this shit. Well, I was going to ask about this because in a second when this fight kind of climaxes with an emphasis on the word climax, we get a whole <laughs> bunch of exploding. But no, they're chasing each other around, flipping over cars, clanging their swords together. At one point, they trigger the sprinkler system and they're having this big fight while the water pours down on them. I would call this cinematic, but it's just so fucking ridiculous. <laughs> they are definitely working hard. It made me wonder what the budget of this thing was. Like, I feel like this was, like, they put a lot of effort into this thing. Yeah, I mean, some of it is just kind of craft, like I said, and you can tell they're being creative as a way to save money, but there's clearly, like, a sizable investment here for the time. The Highlander eventually succeeds in disarming this guy and then chopping his head off. And the head chop effect, not great, but the effects do get slightly better when the guy's decapitated corpse pulses with some sort of blue lightning and gets lifted off the ground. But then the effects get worse again when the Highlander basically jizzes his pants, which causes a bunch of cars to bounce like they're on hydraulics and then explode. He's coming in this seat. This is what happened. (laughs) You know what? I didn't think about it that way, but each time that a immortal, um, like, kills somebody and cuts their head off, this kind of effect happened, right? I didn't understand yeah. it at this moment. The quickening. Is that what it's called? When, yeah. They, uh, when they cut off the person's head and then they absorb all their energy is kind of what I interpreted it as. They yeah, but get they're stronger. pulsing and groaning. Oh, and oh yeah. Got, yeah, it definitely looks like they're coming. It, it's like... Uh, <laughs> it always ends with an explosion. <laughs> Bunch of car light bulbs in this case. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's similar to when Arnold's getting his pump on in uh, Pumping Iron for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it feels like. Um, so yeah, there's just so many explosions, this electricity is happening, and then we get a really quick wipe out of there, right? Like we get our- Well, it wasn't a wipe, it's like a, it's one of those things where the camera tilts up and it passes through the floor, but instead of showing us the next level of the parking garage, we're suddenly in the Scottish Highlands. It's a, it's a, fuck, what's it called? There's um, a lot of that. I found like they u- they used a ton of like, but again that's technical camera. craft. Yeah, 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 there's something there. So yes, while the Highlander rushes away to find some new pants, we transition back <laughs> to the Scottish Highlands of centuries ago, and it's time for some backstory. We see not just Connor McLeod, but the whole clan McLeod, and the men are about to head into battle. A battle, it seems, that will be Connor's first. Safe to say, it does not go the way he expected it to. <laughs> Yeah, there's a bit of buildup here. We see they're in kind of medieval times. I think they say it's 1536. They even throw down the date for us. Um, And then we get a large bosom lady passing some flowers to Connor. She seems like she's all in. She wants him to come back. But you're like you said, it's not necessarily going to go so well for uh, our friend Connor here. How'd this battle go? Well, I mean, when they get to the battle, the big bad of not just the battle, but this whole movie, the Kurgan is his name, is fighting for the other side. He already knows about Connor McLeod, knows he's immortal, and before the fighting starts, orders the men not to attack him. The boy is mine, he says, a full 12 years before Brandy and Monica would set that sentiment to music and take it to the top of the charts. <laughs> did you know that song was about the Highlander? You didn't know that, did you? No, no. I didn't. No. Any, anyway, <laughs> this leads to a hilarious situation where Connor McLeod is literally begging people to fight him. Fight me, damn you! No, that's gonna be killed! Fight me, you coward! No, it's not the Kurgan eventually shows up to oblige, and it takes him literally three seconds to drive his sword right into the Highlander's midsection. Not great! 
I was shocked that he didn't even get his sword up for a single block or parry before he gets run through by Kurgan. Yeah, he's really bad at this, eh? But awful. Yeah. Just yeah. absolutely terrible. You're like, this is going to be the hero. And I guess they're doing that like to show that he's got a lot of work to do to get to where he's going to be in the end. But Yeah, but I feel like a regular guy would have killed him. Like, he was so oh, terrible. Anyone, yeah. Any single person. If he wasn't immortal, he would have been dead. Like Maybe he wouldn't have survived to that age. I don't know if there was any indication. He didn't seem to know that he was immortal. Um, but he gets run through with the sword, and the, uh, the Kurgan, the Bone Man, is about to end him, about to chop his head off, which we know is, or we learn is necessary to kill another immortal, when the other Clan McLeod people sort of dive in and save him. Yeah, his cousins tackle the Kurgan to the ground, giving him the chance to escape, and we escape back to the present through an eye zoom. That's kind of a cool effect, too. Though the Highlander was frantically trying to get out of the parking lot before the police arrive, side note, pretty convenient that his car is the only one still working after his electric orgasm, isn't it? Isn't that kind of weird? <laughs> yeah, it is hilarious. Maybe he knew that he needed to park his car away as from far the away other as cars. possible. Yeah, he yeah. knew what was going to happen <laughs> if he did it. Uh, uh, we see our Connor character in New York City trying to escape that garage, and then he gets surrounded by New York police officers. And now they're going to bust him up, right? They're going to arrest him for what is the chaos that's been caused down there? Oh, God, yes. He's definitely under arrest. And after a brief cut back to the distant past, we get some crime scene footage and also meet our love interest, Brenda. She's some kind of forensic examiner or something, and she immediately spots an antique sword, which, again, not a katana, my bad. Anyway, it turns out the Highlander is going by the name Russell Nash in the present day, and he's an antique dealer, so this sword turning up is exceptionally bad for him. Also exceptionally bad, the interrogation scene we get next. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so the Brenda character, I want to speak about her for a second, though. She's a forensic uh, police officer, or she does the forensic works for the New York City police and helps solve them. But she is also an ancient metal and sword expert. I think that's part of her forensics job. If you're forensics, I'm assuming you have to know chemistry and stuff. That makes sense, right? <laughs> I'm serious. How do you not have yes, to? Yes, but I think your focus is biology and blood, not... Uh, no, because like, weapons. Weapons? I mean, I guess a little bit. It was just hilarious that she was the one who was an expert on ancient swords. I mean, we need to have some convenient stuff to keep pushing this movie forward. We get to that interrogation room, and we're getting some... Just awful humor and or police work here. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily call it humor. Um, I think it is just like your stereotypical 80s cop cliched interrogation stuff. So they try and trick him into telling them that it's his sword and that he knew the guy he killed and that he also killed someone in Jersey the exact same way a couple of days earlier. But he's too smart for them. And that's the nice thing about dealing with stereotypical 80s cops. Instead of having an actual conversation with them, we get exchanges like this one. You're f***ing Nash. Why, Garfield? You're cruising for a piece of ass. I'll tell you what happened, Russell. You went down to the garage for a bleep job. Just didn't want to pay for it. And, of course, they get into a fist fight right there in the station. Just ridiculous. Yeah. I, we're going to talk at the end about some of the things I didn't like in this movie, but one of the key ones was how rough the humor or attempt at humor was in here. I'm pretty sure the comments, the homophobic comments, were definitely intended to be humorous. Like, they wanted people to laugh at those moments. Oh, I don't think in this case. I think in oh. this case he was just trying to rile them up because the accusation that you might possibly be gay in the 80s was like an just, angerable yeah, offense. Yeah, it was angerable, yeah. yeah. But I, there's, it, there's a bit of that in here for sure. There's quite a bit of homophobia and some other comments in here that are pretty rough that age poorly. And that's, 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 just that's come up so many times in our movies, it, especially it, like, you know. It doesn't work well for me, though, here. It seemed like it was was sort of cheap as a way to try to get there. They could have had a much better written conversation, I think. But again, that's the stereotypical 80s cop, yeah. and that's what it is. Yeah. I will say, though, I did like how they at least commented on his weird accent, which is, like, supposed <laughs> to be Scottish, I guess, but it turns out that he's actually French and also totally incapable of doing a Scottish accent. Yeah, this is really bad. He kind of sounds like Jean-Claude Van Damme. But, like, not even... He sounds like Jean-Claude Van Damme trying to do an accent that he can't do. Yeah, Christopher yeah. Lambert is... Probably is it Lambert or Lambert. I mean, Lambert, French, but Lambert. like, yeah, I don't, I don't even know. know. Yeah, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but he sucks ass here. His his <laughs> accent's here? awful. No, it's everywhere. But <laughs> I, I think we're gonna get to it later. But he's probably the biggest problem in this movie. Oh God, yes, yeah. I would say that 100. <laughs> percent Um, the cops let him go, which, in light of the sword and the fact that he was frantically trying to leave the parking lot right after that guy got murdered, seems incredibly unlikely. 
What's even more unlikely is that the Kurgan just happens to be in the area to hear the news of this immortal fight, or was he being, like, summoned there? I'm still not totally clear on that. I think you're right on what you said. I think what's happening is they are all kind of getting summoned to a similar area. We're approaching the gathering. We heard about this in the intro. We don't have a ton of info now, but it seems like there's supposed to be one big event that brings them all together. And I think that's what's brought both of them to New York City at the same time. Now, Well, no, because the Highlander lives there. He's been living there. He has his antique shop. He has made a life there. The other guys are getting pulled there. Yeah, and I think that is for the gathering. Maybe the Highlander is the... I think that is for the movie. I think that's just easier to like, you know. <laughs> well, you're right. I have questions about this gathering. It's been built up in the intro and gets built up throughout, and it never happens. So that's uh, one of the problems yeah, I have with this. the gathering. Them coming there, they don't all be there at the same time. But that's what they made it sound like. Fight. Yeah, they made no, it sound like there was going to be a big thing and that they were all going to be together, and that was going to be the final battle. And that would have been better. I know. <laughs> that's, what I was, that's what I pictured. Yeah. That's what I thought was going to happen here the fact that he gets to walk out of there is batshit you're right there's enough evidence to place never. him at they'd the never, scene they make him disappear yeah. they never have that happen there's no way that he gets to walk out of there now the we get the intro to kurgan and he's kind of like rocking out almost to some like heavy metal punkish music and he's dressed kind of like a 80s punk i would suggest yeah like a, or like a biker like all leather yeah and like studs spikes so the Kurgan checks into a seedy fucking motel. This reminded me of those kind of hotels we saw in The Exterminator last season. Just fucking dumps full of drugs and crooks and hookers. And while he's uh, settling in there, the Highlander and Brenda have a little meat cute. Actually, it's more like a meat creepy. As after startling her at the crime scene, the Highlander tails Brenda to a bar and says he wants to walk her home. A little intense. No? This was really creepy. Yeah. I, I don't know if it was written that way or that was the best that Lambert could deliver it because... It looked like he was there trying to, like... Kill her and wear her skin. Yeah. <laughs> it was real rough. The whole way that he approached this relationship with her was baffling to me. He was very, very forward, but never built a rapport with her. And then, like, had expectations that, like, she would f*** him. And it works. And it's just baffling. It works. Right? Because we talked about so many times. They fall, they fall in love within, like, 48 hours of meeting each other. And him being a fucking creep. Like, it's of all the, of all the immediate romantic entanglements, this one is perhaps the most egregious. Yeah. It was... It was absolutely awful. So he follows her um, to this bar, and she says no, and she heads out. But when he goes to leave, she decides that she's going to trail him. She's going to follow him through the streets of New York. And somehow this movie finds just the best setting for sword fights that just pop up out of nowhere, huh? The nice thing about New York City, especially in like the 70s or the 80s, there are lots of places you can go where it's going to be almost like a post-apocalyptic, like derelict buildings, like weird, just like landfill sites where it, you can you have all these interesting backdrops. And that is cool. Um, we get just a series of incredibly dramatic close-ups here as he senses that she's following him, but also that they're in danger. So he pulls her in close, tells her to be quiet. But then the Kurgan literally pops up into the frame like he was crouched directly beside them. Where the hell did he come from? <laughs> Dude is like seven feet tall. He just pops up and not like from behind something. He literally just comes up into the frame. And I was like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> Did he jump up through an empty manhole? Like, yeah. what the fuck? It was funny because... We we also, we talked about the music. We had kind of a bit of an 80s love song going on in their first meeting here. Like when they're meeting on the street and he's telling her to be quiet, we've got some 80s love song. And then very dramatically, we hit into some synth for mood. And then you're right. Kurgan pops out of nowhere. And now we have a fight in some kind of factory area, it seems like. They fight it out only briefly before a police helicopter scares the Kurgan off. And after a lecture from the Highlander. You only have one life. You value it. Go home. <laughs> we cut back to the past where he has made a miraculous recovery from his injuries. As you might have guessed, his family is thrilled. Nope, sorry, I read that wrong. His family wants him killed. <laughs> they think he's a witch. Oh, my God. They they think that he is the devil or he's been possessed by the devil because being run through by the sword means that he should be dead. But what's ridiculous is the woman who gave him the flowers and <laughs> sent him yeah, off man. has immediately turned on him and wants him fucking burned alive. Yeah, complete 180. She goes from, like, madly in love, bawling her eyes at his bedside to literally screaming, no, kill him, after his cousin suggested is banish him instead. Yeah, it's insane. I, I, I'm like, somebody has a very poor opinion of women, whoever wrote this, because it's obviously the woman who is the problem here. I was like, getting a strange messaging in this whole 
section. What's funny is I have my next line written down here is remind me never to date a Scottish woman. <laughs> but no, but hang on. But but I say that. I say that. But after a brief stop at the Highlander's home antique shop, we go back to the past and he's got a new woman now. Her name's Heather and she literally tells him he can nail her as much as he wants forever. So long story short, I guess I might have rushed the judgment earlier. <laughs> No, no, he's, he's, he's found a new lady, and as we see in a second, someone has also found him. It's Sean Connery. He is playing the role of Juan Sanchez Villalobos Ramirez, and unbelievably, he's also stealing the title of worst accent in this movie from Christopher Lambert. I would have lost a ton of money on that. <laughs> There's a whole lot that happens in this section. Come on, man. That, oh you must God. have a huge oh. problem with the Connery character. I have so many problems with all of what's about, like, what just happened. <laughs> so, so, one... We move on really quickly from him being beaten and running away to him meeting this Heather character. And he is madly in love. And they switch to him banging her in the plains of Scotland or the highlands of Scotland, which, I mean, I wish they showed a little more, but that's fine. It was uh, I thought maybe we were rolling on a, a PG Classic, rating yeah. here or a PG-13 rating. I couldn't tell what the rating of this movie was. I was actually struggling throughout to decide. Not only does Sean Connery show up with an incredibly racist name, He's pretty much black-faced. Well, he's supposed to... They, they find out later he's not Spanish. He's supposed to be Egyptian. And I yeah. was like, what? They took out an already ridiculous piece of casting and made it even worse. I was like, oh, pardon me? So he's one dressed obscenely. His name's ridiculous. Oh, he's dressed in traditional Spanish garb. His makeup is... Is that not traditional Spanish garb? I, I don't know. His makeup's insane. And his accent sucks ass. He, well, he has no accent. He's just talking like Sean Connery. Yeah, He's not which doing is right. Yeah, yeah, it's true, right? Which but is he's supposed to be yeah. an Egyptian by way of Spain. Like, you'd think there'd be something who'd else there. Who'd spent time in Japan. He pulls up and, like, is over top of them as Lambert climaxes inside Heather. Like, <laughs> his timing is perfect. Oh, Connery was definitely watching the end of that, yeah. Oh, yeah, he just shows up. He pulled up. up and was like, oh, just in time. <laughs> That's a great Egyptian accent you have there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm just, like, struggling so hard. I don't understand why he's here. Clearly, he's here to be a mentor. We're yeah, gonna he's the Mr. Quickly. Miyagi yeah. role. That's, that's yeah. who he is. So we know why they brought Connery in, but it the casting makes zero sense other than Connery was popular or you were, like, leaning into his name. Here's a hot take. Why not have Sean Connery be the fucking Highlander and Christopher Lambert be, like, some French guy who comes and teaches him stuff and everyone's in their lane, you know? It would have been way better. I way, agree. Way better. Yeah. yeah. Although I will say, I think they wanted the Highlander to be a little younger. What the fuck does it matter if you're immortal? Well, that's the other question I have. Why do some age and some don't? Great question. So I, my thought on this is wild, wild speculation, pure theory. Maybe you don't become immortal till the first time you get killed. Oh. Because Lambert grows to a certain age, goes to that battle, gets stabbed, and he looks like that for the rest of the movies. So maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's like when you first die and become immortal, that's like your first death is like your entry it's, into it's your entry into it. That's an interesting theory. I There needs to be something there because it's not explained at all. All of the people we see are of different ages, yep. right? So I don't know. I struggled with that strange thing because clearly he's much older and he is there. But I, I that is going to placate me for a little bit. There you go. But I, I would have liked him to be in the Scottish role for sure. That Way would make so much had. more yeah. sense. Yeah, um, here's something I never thought I had, and it became crystal clear to me in this sequence. Some of the facial expressions Lambert is making here are truly bizarre. Like anytime it cuts to the close-up and he's got looks on his face – I don't know, man. He Just, is a... I think every single direction was about him being through the prostate because he both looked like he was in pain and pleasure at all times and it didn't make any sense. <laughs> it's very weird choices. And not to be outdone, Sean Connery is just chewing the scenery here. He's going to teach Connor McLeod about his immortality and everything that comes along with it and apparently step one is get hit by lightning a bunch. Connery explains it like this. The sensation you're feeling is the quickening. We are the same, McLeod. We are brothers. <laughs> Thanks there, Juan Sanchez. That totally answers my questions. Yeah, oh my God. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. There, there's a lot that's unexplained in here. It's a two-hour movie, and they do a really bad job of communicating a lot of stuff that I think would have been important. And then having a lot of stuff that's just absolute bullshit. So it's sort of funny. I felt like there were some strange choices in that. 
Well, the hits just keep on coming here as the next scene is maybe my favorite in the whole movie. The boat scene. Oh, God. Connery has the Highlander balancing on a rowboat as part of his training. And after a ridiculous argument, he tips him into the water, which leads us to a shot of Christopher Lambert basically standing in the bottom of what looks like a giant fish tank, marveling at the fact that he's alive. This did not look even a little bit realistic. No. And the... The sound of him, like, singing or yelling underwater had me, like, laughing my ass off. He's, like, looking at his hands and being yeah. like, I'm alive. <laughs> God oh, damn it. Gurgle, gurgle, gurgle. It has, like, the gurgling sounds and yeah. he's, like, yelling out. Yeah, it's it's really, really bad. It is. Now, I'm very curious for your thoughts on the next section because it is basically the world's slowest training montage. As Connery puts mm. him through the paces on the beach, in the forest, and on top of a mountain. And for me... <laughs> This would have been a thousand percent better if instead of the soaring cinematic music, we had an up-tempo 80s banger. Just a waste of the time that this movie was made. You're making a movie in the 80s, you put a fucking 80s banger in there for the montage. Missed opportunity. You know what's hilarious is before that section happened, I literally wrote down, I hope a montage is coming. You like, sense it. You could sense it. It was building like the to the Highlander that sensing the gathering. You can sense a montage. I could sense a montage. My my <laughs> montage senses were tingling. I could feel it on the back of my neck. I knew that this was the moment that it needed to happen. And this underwhelmed me to an extreme. Because of the music, yeah. right? It was the music, music and the, the pace. pace. Yeah. yeah. Like there was so much opportunity in here to have an incredible training montage. And we didn't get any of that. I agree. There could have been an incredible Queen 80s banger. It would have been fantastic. Everyone would have been out of their seats cheering in the fucking theater if this had to happen. <laughs> yeah. But instead, we kind of get that like very like soaring, swooping, more emotional and less like fun and interesting kind of training session. It's like me. classical music. It's not rock. It's like a classical. It's just an orchestra score essentially, as opposed to you know. Yeah, yeah. Like it, nowhere fast from fucking Streets of Fire. Oh, that would have been amazing. Oh yeah, just amazing. And yeah, it's just so bad. There's too many scenes of him in his Spanish outfit and all of his awful makeup, and the acting's well, really you were, bad. You were really down on Connery. Oh, Elizabeth. I hated this this <laughs> character. It sucked ass, and and I really struggled that they didn't get a good montage sequence. I also thought we'd have better mentorship. We'd learn more through right. that relationship. He speaks in riddles. Yeah, and we do find out that the gathering is coming and that there's an ultimate prize. Yeah. And we, we learned that if the Kurgan wins, things are going to go dark. So their goal is to stop that, right? The reason why he's getting help from another immortal is because nobody wants Kurgan to win yeah. at all. There you go. He's telling you a lot. I guess we're getting a little you're, bit of you're that. So, but, uh, you're so down on Connery. I don't get it. I'm hating it. I'm hating it, yeah. Well, he won't be around much longer, so don't worry. Uh, this all, of course, ends with the Highlander finally beating Sean Connery in combat, but there's still one more lesson he has to learn. The immortals cannot have children, and they will never have a family, and he's going to have to let Heather go. We learned a couple more things here. First, that the katana he used in the parking garage was actually Connery's. It was a gift from his former father-in-law some hundreds of years ago. And second, that the Kurgan is the strongest of the immortals, a perfect warrior, Connery says. And guess what? He's here! Ooh, shit. Kurgan senses that our McLeod character is getting some training, and he doesn't want him to get stronger. He doesn't want to have someone to fight him so we know he's gonna go try to stop ramirez and mcleod from getting too strong right he wants to be able to take this down he wants that ultimate prize he wants to turn the earth dark that's for sure now he arrives at the highlanders castle is it a castle it's kind of like this little tower thing i don't know yeah, it's a it's a lame castle um but you're right he arrives there to find mcleod but does he find him there no it's just connery and of course connor mcleod's lady heather so connery and the kurgan battle it out inside of whatever the fuck this building is but in the end despite sean connery slitting his throat dumping him about four stories down to the stone ground below and stabbing him right through the gut the kurgan is victorious running his sword through connery's heart and cutting his head off and now it's time for the kurgan to have a lightning orgasm <laughs> you forgot to mention that as they're battling in this tower every time their sword struck one of the rocks a huge chunk of the castle fell apart oh the castle is decimated by the end of this yeah and the whole time that this is happening heather like mcleod's sort of partner or lady just stands and screams in the basement she doesn't try to run she doesn't try to get any help she just stands there the whole time while the whole castle is falling around her. Yeah, it's not a strong role for her. Holy fuck. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's well. like, what the fuck is <laughs> happening here? Now, I'm watching it, and I'm I'm really frustrated. Uh, there's hilarious guitar riffs that are every time the Kurgan enters. We're getting, like, this really cool metal guitar riff. 
I actually kind of really enjoy the Kurgan character. I don't know who plays him. Oh he my looks, god! All he right. looks super familiar. Uh, he's been in a bunch of stuff. I can't think of his name right now. He's in Starship Troopers. The yes. Kurgan is the guy, his fucking drill instructor yes. who ends up killing the brain bug and is the hero at the end. That's the same fucking yes, guy. Yes, that's right. And he does a really good job. Like, I think that he, it, out of all of the people in this movie, it is the character that I think lands the best for me. Yeah. I, I want to give him props for that. I do not agree with that. We're going to have a like wild okay. disagreement. Right. Okay. Anyway. Now we know why the Highlander is who and where he is, and it sure seems like Brenda has figured out some things, too. She swings by his antique shop to press him on the details of the sword she found at the crime scene, and he tries to charm her into a dinner. Then we get a weird aside where his assistant says she's worried, people are asking about him, and he jokingly says to tell them he's immortal. And then we explode to footage of him running for his life during World War II. Like, literally explode. The frame shatters outward, and we're just there. Yeah, there's a lot of transitions. This is where you're saying that the craft's coming in, right? We're getting a ton of that, and we're getting some more backstory here. He's in World War II. We see him running for a bit, and I don't know how he finds her, but he finds a little girl hiding in what looks like a burned-out or a destroyed factory building. He tells her it's going to be okay and tells her that he's got some magic and that she should come with him, and he's going to try to help her escape the situation she agrees, and he pulls her out of this space, and then we get a Nazi. Oh, yeah, a Nazi shoots him right in the back, but he cannot die. That's the magic he was talking about. And we get now what might be the worst acting in the whole entire movie. He gets a hold of the Nazi's gun and tells him, Move. Nein. Erst musst du mich erschießen. <laughs> Whatever you say, Jack. You're the master race. God damn, Lambert. <laughs> Was that the best take they got? Like, he's awful. <laughs> it's it's out of control how bad his line delivery is. Yeah. I don't know how many rewrites they had to make to the script to make this movie work as him in the leading role because... They're just it, ripping pages out of the script. Oh, no, nope, yeah. less dialogue. Yeah. Less dialogue for Christopher. I would love to have a conversation with the writers of this shit because they must have just fucking shit themselves seeing the takes that were happening here. Fuck, man, it was rough. Uh, anyway, it turns out that that little girl, of course, was his assistant now in the present day. And what she's really worried about is that he's lonely. He won't let anyone love him. Or will he? I mean, he's going to want to f*** Brenda. <laughs> yeah. And right on cue, it's time for their dinner date. Now, she's using this as an opportunity to hopefully get more information out of him. She sets up a running tape recorder and loads a gun just in case. And he uses this as an opportunity to make more super weird facial expressions. He is on to her whole plan from the jump, although he's not sure whether it's just her or her and the police. She explains what she wants to know, and his response is to get all moody because I guess he's in love with her already. Like, if I was her, I'd be super confused by his reaction. They've had, like, a conversation and a half, so why is he all grumpy that she's using him for information? Yeah, it's it's really fucked up. He does seem to have very strong feelings for her quickly, and she has strange feelings too, right? You can tell she takes her time when she gets prepared for this dinner, um, and it doesn't go as she's got planned. I would, I would complain about that, but he has been around for centuries, so he knows when he's been put into a trap. Well, we flash back to his old love with an emphasis on old. I guess he stuck it out with Heather after all, and now her good looks have withered away, replaced by some truly shitty makeup effects. They say an insanely dramatic goodbye as we get her death scene, scored to what is perhaps the worst Queen song ever recorded. Who wants to live forever? <laughs> Not me if it means listening to this fucking song again. <laughs> Yeah, this is all really strange, right? The age makeup that they put on her here is some of the worst in cinematic history. Yeah, it's real bad. It's fucking awful. The scene where he's holding her as she's dying of old age. We're in the Highlands. We see that you're wearing this and she's fucking dying. Yeah. I laughed my ass off. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is one of those moments where I'm like, I'm a horrible person because we're having what is supposed to be the most, like, sentimental scene in this entire movie, and I'm just laughing so fucking hard. But I it's not your fault. It. It's not your fault they can't pull this off. Oh, they didn't get anywhere close to pulling it off. It was kind of, to me, like, I was thinking back to Karate Kid when the two have to grab hands over the dying father, and it's just so bullshit that you're laughing <laughs> so hard. That's what it reminded me of, and it was so, so bad. She's gone, um, and he's lost his love, but I don't care. Right? Yeah. Like, they really didn't do it for me. Uh, it just made me realize how bad it was. You're right, the song sucks. I am digging most of the queen that's going on here. I don't know how. Yeah, but I'm not enjoying this one. 
So like you said, she's gone, and the next morning, the Highlander meets up with an old immortal friend of his, and they reminisce about fun old times. The Highlander tells a story about a time he got into a duel with a foppish noble, a duel that we see he lost several times over. This scene was kind of fun, I guess, but they could have easily cut it along with this whole old friend thing. Like, it's obvious they're just bringing this guy in to get killed by the Kurgan, which he does, along with some ex-Marine vigilante type who just happens to find them sword fighting in the next scene. This is padding, padding padding all of this but i don't understand why they needed to have padding i don't either it's a two hour long movie yeah i cut that shit out i wrote this in here all of this section doesn't make any sense to me if you cut this 10 minutes out and put it all into explaining more backstory or helping me understand what the highlander is or what the gathering is or what the ultimate prize is i would be much more happy than seeing this um, that section of him getting stabbed by the like noble over and over again doesn't make any sense. It's to me. meant to be comedy, and it's well, yeah, not funny. And it doesn't come off funny. Yeah, that's where I think they struggled here. I think they were trying to add levity at sections in this, and it just didn't work. Yeah, no, and the padding continues because the cops interview that vigilante guy who I guess survived, then talk to a hot dog vendor on the street, then confront Brenda who's busy chasing down her own leads. And I'm asking myself, why is any of this in here? No. The movie is about the Highlander, not about the cops investigating the Highlander. Like you could. Make maybe make the argument that the Brenda stuff is necessary for them to end up in a relationship or whatever. But I honestly would have been fine without all this. You said 10 minutes, more like 25 minutes, like right towards the end of the movie, cut it out, bring this thing under 90. Yeah, I agree. And a lot of it was an attempt to add levity, right? There's a scene where the like some old lady is like yeah, on the car. That's the exactly Kurgan what I'm talking about. Steals the car to escape. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And I don't understand what they're trying to do there. It just doesn't make sense. But so we have 25 minutes of nothingness. And then we transition to Brenda figuring out that he's immortal. Yes, and things kick up a notch in the next scene as the Highlander makes his annual pilgrimage to a church in order to light a candle for his lady Heathers like he promised her he would on her deathbed. But the Kurgan knows him well, well enough to show up at the church and make a pussy licking motion at some nuns, which they did not respond well to. Nuns. No sense of humor. He also licks a priest. It's a <laughs> strange sequence. Yeah, this is where he's definitely pushing the lines. Uh he probably had a lot of fun recording the sequence, I would guess. The actor? Yeah. If you're into that sort of thing, yeah. If he's like deeply religious, he was probably very conflicted. Oh, that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. He was very much doing things that were offensive in that church. He also, for some reason, has mangled his hair. To be in disguise? Or I don't know. Like, it made no sense. I don't know. They've done a lot of makeup on him to make him look a little more grotesque as he's having this scene in the church. We do learn earlier in the movie that in a church they cannot kill each other. Yeah, it is no a fighting holy on holy ground. Yeah, yeah. So, so we know that there's not going to be the final sort of battle here. But what we do is we the Kurgan tells him that he raped Heather. Yeah, so we get a final reveal, even though we're still about 20 minutes away from the end of this movie. It turns out that after he killed Sean Connery, the Kurgan raped what he thought at the time was Sean Connery's woman. But we, of course, know that she was actually with Connor McLeod. The Highlander, though, is learning this information for the first time, so he is immediately ready to fight, but because they're on holy ground, the Kurgan tells him he'll have to wait. And I know the reason why. It's so the Highlander can reveal his secret to Brenda and they can hook up. There is literally no other reason to not do the fight right then, step outside, Highlander wants to do it, but no, we need the romantic thing to end and we need a sex scene. You're right. They want to have another relationship here. They want to like ratchet up the loss that could happen for he needs a happy ending. McLeod. Literally. <laughs> or figuratively? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they just want to also have maybe a little bit more sex scene in this, which, I mean, I'm not going to complain about. I'm going to interrupt you because I know what you're going to mention. <laughs> I'm just going to get it out of the way. As I'm sure you noticed in this sex scene, we got some uh, breast and mouth here, nipple and mouth. So that is the about 15th or 16th time I've been proven wrong on that. I made a statement very early on in our podcast that I'd never seen that before. And it turns out that I've seen it many times and it keeps popping up the movie. So there you go. Just go ahead. <laughs> Nipple and mouth. It happened again. I continue to be wrong. Now, just like you uh, breaking in here out of nowhere to share that moment, uh, the sex scene comes out of nowhere in this. There's not very much built, right? He tells her that he's an immortal and then immediately they're kissing and then immediately they are f She kisses him and then they're just standing there naked in the moonlight. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then immediately they right down are to bodies it. embraced. And well, banging. also, the sex scene ends very abruptly. Yes. They're going at it like mid-coitus. The music, they don't even fade the music out. The music's going full bore and all of a sudden they just cut to something else and I was like, whoa, the hell? Well, and it cuts to lions roaring. It's not even like a chill. Like we're, we're right into some lions. It's a loud climax for both of them. Yeah. Is what it is. That's I guess all, that's so. all it's got to be. Yeah. I thought we would see a little bit more like Electricity spread between their genitals as the uh, <laughs> as he 
Again, I just assume that's what happens when a Highlander he also yeah. shoots out the a wind, bit of like rushes through yeah. the apartment. And, yeah. yeah, which is why women will have sex with him, even though he has a terrible accent and is not handsome. It's an experience, if nothing else. Anyway, the next day, she basically wishes him good luck with the Kurgan. Take care of yourself. Don't lose your head. But little does she know, she's going to be very involved in this, as the Kurgan kidnaps her and takes her on an extremely overacted hell ride. Dude is cranked up way too far here, and he really needs to dial it back. I actually really enjoy this kind of high intensity no, stream. Oh, it's cartoony. It's over the top, man. He's just re being ridiculous. Well, we get intense music. We get all these shots of them driving through New York City. He's playing chicken. He's immortal and he's trying to scare her. So he, he runs some guy off the road on a fucking. Oh, he runs people over. He just straights. He starts singing New York, New York as they're like flying through the streets and going. And then it transitions into Queen singing New York, New York as they're. Finishing off this but a kind weird, of hell like, ride, trippy version of it. It was, it was, it was really yeah. weird. Um, but I, I actually really like this section. I thought, I guess because I like that character, I, I was terrible. into it. Really, that's yeah. hilarious. We are, we are completely, completely opposite ends in this one. Yeah. Um, we transition to the next morning, and we have McLeod listening to his answering machine. And he gets a message from Kurgan, mm. and it's got our Brenda character screaming in the background. So Man. we know that we're approaching the final fight here. We know that we're getting towards it. He says goodbye to that little girl he saved who's now an old bag. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, she's not, she's not that old. Yeah, she's not that old. I mean, she's probably in grandmother territory. She looks better than not. fucking old Heather did, that's for sure. <laughs> so he says goodbye to her. Yeah, so after a quick goodbye to his yeah. assistant, the Highlander makes his way to the Silver Cup factory where the Kurgan has Brenda tied to a big neon sign. The sword fight begins with the Kurgan gaining an early advantage and the Highlander having to very slowly slide down a cable. That effect wasn't great. The Kurgan starts chopping up the metalwork, holding up the sign. Letters are falling. Brenda is screaming. Somehow a bunch of water ends up on the roof and looks like we're going to bookend this movie with a bunch of soggy fighting. <laughs> so in their battle, uh, there is one of those, you know, the water towers that are on top of a yeah, building. Yeah, it's like a store, a big tank. Yeah, yeah, so there's one of them on there. So that does get sliced. So the whole thing falls down, and Brenda is attached to it, but she doesn't crash and die. She actually climbs back up, so we get a little bit of her showing some skills while this final battle is happening. What I'm curious about is, as they're fighting, we've get got some of that power running through them, the electricity. Yep. They are standing in water. Oh, yeah, they're getting electrocuted the whole time. But they don't show that. Like, no. I know they're immortal and electricity wouldn't kill them, but I would have liked to have seen a lot more of that in what was happening to them. They do They do show Brenda when she climbs back up from the sign falling down. She's holding onto the ledge. She can't step on the roof because of the water. So she is like, which, okay. which is nice. It's a nice little touch there because, yeah, if she touched the water, she would die immediately. But you're right. Where's the where's the lightning effects for that? I where's that? So they're fighting on this water-covered roof, and then all of a sudden the two of them break through one of those windows on top and in into a warehouse yep this shot of them falling what was your opinion about it uh i mean it's a little silly is what I, it is i had to walk away i yeah. laughed so hard it was <laughs> so bad they were clearly on wires and the facial expressions particularly of lambert were just so fucking over the top yeah and so slowed down it felt like slow-mo that i lost it i was like oh my god this is insane <laughs> But so they fall to the ground. We have this horrible moment as they're falling through the sky. Both of them get up fine because they're immortals and yep. this fight continues. It does. And the Kurgan manages now to disarm the Highlander and he's about to deliver a kill strike when suddenly fucking Brenda, who mere seconds ago was clinging to that ledge some 60 feet above them and definitely couldn't step onto the roof because the water, like you mentioned, somehow she appears in the room and clubs him in the back with a metal pipe. How in the fuck does she possibly get down there? Yeah, I don't know. She gets down there conveniently. They do show her coming through the door, so clearly she'd run down How? somehow. Down I don't what? Know. How? Fire escape on the yeah, side? She I never would have so. made it there in time. They fall so far so fast. This fight happens. She would still be coming down from the roof. There's zero chance. That is beyond convenient. I mean, based on the slow motion fall, it took them about 27 minutes to get to the floor, <laughs> so I think she had time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you're right. It's very convenient. She's there. She whacks Kurgan with a pipe to distract him, right? As he's about to, like, hit the final blow on McLeod. He has has him dead to rights and he just looks around looks back and laughs at her yeah but this is enough to give the highlander time to retrieve his sword and after delivering your standard what kept you style one-liner he ends up getting the kurgan sword away from him and killing him while the triumphant music soars and then staring deeply into the camera he reminds us there can be only one 
cue the animation for some reason? Tons of it. So we first we get a window blast. All the windows blow out. And then we get this strange, like, white energy volcano with almost, like, animation monsters. Like, we have all of these things coming out. We know that when you kill another immortal, you gain their power. But now he is the last one. We are getting that moment. And... I really didn't know how I felt about the animation moment. It reminded me of, like, what's that Disney movie? Was it Fantasia? Where yes. you got the mountain and all this stuff, like, swirling around. It reminded me of that. Just lightning everywhere, making the shape of, like, bats and wolves, dragons, monsters. We get the eye zoom about 17 times in a row while the Highlander screams that he knows everything. He is everything. I can't totally make sense of this either, but luckily, the final scene is there to kind of clean things up a little bit. Yeah, like you said, this all happens. We have this huge moment, and then we transition to the Highlands. And this is not past Highlands. We are here modern-day Highlands. And he's there with Brenda, and they're sitting on a beautiful spot and talking. And now we're going to get the exposition to tell us what the result is. Yes, and we actually end as we begin with a Connery voiceover. And the Highlander shares a passionate kiss with Brenda, and we're into the credits. And the credits feature the exact kind of song that I wanted for the training montage. Come on, guys. <laughs> it's <laughs> the, right there. The outro is definitely better than some of the other songs that they had in there. I thought it was interesting because they talk about the prize in that final section. Um, and they basically say that it's knowledge of yeah, what yeah. everyone knows and is thinking and doing. It's omnipotence, essentially. Yeah, so he's got all or of no, that. omniscience. He's not, he's not all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's omnis- yes. omniscient. So he's all-knowing. And he does mention that he needs to now use it for good. And I believe he also mentions that he can have children again and is mortal again. See, so we were arguing with this off mic because I said, like, I thought the prize was going to be now you are a mortal man. You will live your life because, after all, who wants to live forever? Uh, <laughs> but then, but I, I didn't think that was communicated clearly at the end, but you think it was. I think it was. I, it's possible. I, I think he's mortal. I think he can have children. I think he and Brenda are going to have some kids together. Um, what was frustrating to me was... The Highlander can use his knowledge to make life a better place for everyone. That's basically what they're saying. But yeah, he'll be able to accept, okay, he can tell what politicians are thinking. Yeah. Some fucking alleged Scottish guy with a bullshit accent walks in and is like, listen, just so you know, this is going to happen. Are you going to fucking listen to that guy? You're like, this guy's a crazy man. Get him away from me. But I would think if you had that power, the world would be an awesome place. I don't, I don't know any of the following Highlander fiction, so I don't know if he does fix stuff. Like, if we were trying to take it in today, he fucked it, right? Like, he did not do it. <laughs> he had 30 or 40 years to do awesome shit, and he didn't make it happen. The 80s right? really were the apex of human civilization. That's what you're saying? <laughs> that, was the, that was the golden era? <laughs> I don't know about that. Maybe of awesome bad movies. Um, but uh, I'm not sure about where we were as people but you would think it would be way better i'm i'm curious to what happens later well but there's only one way to find out my man highlander 2 i don't know that Get i can it. do it i guess i gotta see it but so. uh and i know there's a whole bunch of tv shows too i don't know if they make it better but now that i've seen the highlander it's gonna keep me it's gonna keep bothering me i need one more thing yeah one more thing log on the fire yeah, yeah so uh we should probably transition to our ratings now the way we always do this we rate the movie on a scale of one to ten two times one to ten for how bad it is one to ten for how enjoyable and the goal is to find movies that are a ten out of ten on both scales or what we call the Crit 20. 20, 20, 20, 20. And for me, I found this movie to be pretty fucking bad. I think that the Christopher Lambert acting in particular just is the giant fucking anchor dragging this thing down to the ground. I don't understand how he had a career. Like, the accent is a huge problem. His facial expressions were bordering on disturbing. Just, like, (laughs) everything he's in, I'm like, the fuck are these choices? What is he doing? So that was a problem for me. He's in almost every single scene. There is some craft here. I'm not going to go a full 10 because, again, some of the editing is well done. Um, There's way too much padding in this. We talked about this. There's, like, 25 minutes very close to the end that don't need to happen. We don't need half the scenes with the Kurgan in them. We already know he's a badass thanks to the flashback and Connery's stories. This thing is almost two hours, and it did not need to be. I have this as a nine bad. These, These obstacles were just too big for me to overcome. I think it's very bad, but because of the technical craft that we saw, I'm going to knock it out to a nine, not a 10. What did you think? I, I have to 100% agree on Lambert, right? Like He's the, awful. My first note on this was how bad he was. Like, just absolutely atrocious. The story, so many unanswered questions, trying to be, like, mysterious at the same time as not actually giving you enough for me to fucking care about it was really frustrating. The forced love stuff, the lack of payoffs. I thought the humor that they attempted to inject was poor. I thought that the fighting was slow and didn't come off well. That's probably aged, but I I didn't like it. 
the sword explosions too. Fucking sword explosions. <laughs> Holy shit, they were driving me crazy. Right. Um, and I know you got to do this to like make it entertaining and exciting, but they were just way over the top. But I will say, like you, you could tell there was a lot of money and craft and time. And I also did like the acting of certain characters, which you disagree I with. I cannot fucking I know you hate that. I know you, you hate were that. on board with the Kurgan. But I, I think Kurgan, for me, and uh, what we're going to get to enjoy soon, a couple other things in there, left me at a 9 too. Okay. I was very close to a 10, but I, I couldn't pull the trigger. Sounds like we're very, we're very yeah. well aligned, and although for potentially different reasons. So how enjoyable on a scale of 1 to 10 did you find this movie? So here's the things I liked. I liked the Kurgan. We know you hate that. I don't know why. But I, I I, thought it was an effective villain. I thought it worked well. I thought he pulled it off. He's just too over the top. He's too campy. You think it's, it's too so far exaggerated yeah. that I'm like, this dude is playing a character. He did not seem like a mm-hmm. realistic evil guy. He seemed like an actor who's like, I'm going to go and I'm going to do this. But you think in any moral world where you have horrible, like Christopher Lambert acting, you're not going to have this awesome guy? Sean Connery's performance was much more restrained than the Kurgan's. Oh, just fuck right off. No, that's <laughs> you're just trolling me right that's now. That's where we're at. You're just trolling me right now. Um, I did enjoy much of the music. Um, I thought there was way too little of it, and I thought it didn't appear maybe at the right times, but there were some. There were some action shots and sequences that w- I enjoyed, in particular that car chase, which you hated. I also laughed a lot. Like, I laughed a whole lot at this movie, which made me enjoy it, but not because they were trying to make me laugh. It's always a, it's always a disclaimer. Yeah. This is definitely one of those movies where it was so bad, I had a lot of fun watching it. Which That's is kind a, of the point. Which is the yeah, point of this, doing here. with this yep. podcast. So, despite it being a piece of shit movie, I still <laughs> had it as a nine enjoyable. Okay, that's pretty high score for watch, you. Which is yeah, high, yeah no, 18 overall for me. But what was your enjoyability? Well, it's not as high as yours. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah. Because I thought the Kurgan was bullshit, over the top, drove me crazy. I thought the music was garbage. Queen with some of their worst songs ever. I, I just couldn't handle it. Every time the quickening happened, like <laughs> you just every time an immortal orgasms, died, yeah. any drama was immediately undermined by them just c-ing for like 15 seconds straight <laughs> while the wind blows through your hair. And I know it's not actually meant to represent him, c-ing, at least I'd think it's not, but that's all I could think of. Like every time, and it completely took me out of whatever stakes were supposed to be in this. I just didn't find as much of this funny as you did, I think. Like there were times when I laughed for sure, and but there were other times where it was more of a groan than a laugh, like mm-hmm. a legitimate, like, oh, fuck. I did enjoy Connery's part, which I know you did not, but we're just complete opposites on the characters we liked in this movie. I only have this as a seven. This was my second or third watch. I think that might have affected it. Maybe I, I think I might have liked it more the first time. Like I remember liking this movie more than I felt I was enjoying it as I watched it this time. So I think it was maybe like a diminishing returns thing where if I watch it again, it'll be even lower. So I'm at a seven. What about the beer though? Well, so I've had this beer before and I enjoyed it before and I enjoyed it again today. It is a malty light like not offensive easy to drink uh, not too hoppy for me but it's got some like strong ale flavor so again i described it as a cold weather beer at the start i think this is a beer i would not want to drink like on a hot summer day but for like the cool fall winter really appropriate for that and i enjoyed it before i enjoyed it again today what about you no uh i enjoyed it it was easy to drink i was done pretty quickly i i definitely could have taken down another today um as we have this sort of cooler weather like you said this is not the style that i lean towards it's very mall forward yeah which is not your jam no i tend to be more of a hot forward fella but uh, i still enjoy a good beer What's interesting, though, is I don't know whether I'll find any more Highlander brewing beers. Yeah, uh, we don't know. Yeah, I yeah. don't know if there's going to be another generation of them. Is it like the Highlander? Are they going to like reemerge or going to have some more immortals? Or maybe some of the recipes are going to be taken over by some of the other breweries that we hopefully will drink or have drank on our podcast, too. So, Listen, if there's one lesson I've learned from this movie is that you have to enjoy things while they're there because they will not be around. Who wants to live forever? we got to get that message of enjoy while we're here. There you go. That's that's, a, that's the message from this beer and from this movie. And from our podcast. We did it. Enjoy life. There Do you it go. Now. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, speaking of enjoying things, next week we are going to be watching a movie that I have never seen before. I don't think you've ever seen it before. But I have a sneaking suspicion we are going to enjoy this movie. Next week's movie is Cat People. <laughs> what? So basically, this, this is, is another this 80s is, movie. This is the musical, right, Cats? No, not Cats. God, no. No, this is Cat People. It's an 80s, uh, I guess, kind of horror movie about people who transform into cats to have sex with each other. I think there's like... Uh, <laughs> is this about furries? 
but but like imagine if instead of in a costume they were just actual like jungle cats. So people, as I understand it, this people is, transform and then some people have the ability to switch between cat and human form. We'll clarify this after we watch the movie, I think. But I am very intrigued in what this is going to be. Yeah, uh, and here's a little more uh, bait on the hook for you. Original song by David Bowie. <gasps> so you know, we get a little Bowie. We get a little probably ridiculous 80s effects we get some sax sounds like a recipe for success <laughs> i feel like this is might be a little awkward to watch together but i'm gonna enjoy we gotta it. have yeah. a couple of these every yeah. season we Come need, on, a, we body need a evidence <laughs> your basic instinct too we yeah, there's more in that i can't think of right now yeah. no nah, man we're gonna do it next week cat people before then if you have not already please follow us on social media at the bmb podcast on twitter and instagram feel free to send us emails the bmb podcast at gmail.com absolutely we always love to hear from you and we are still accepting requests for the rest of our third season but please join us next week for cat people until then i'm cooper and i'm nolan and we'll see you next time on bad movies and gear keep on living there can be only one